preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Uh, good evening. Uh, welcome to the fourth of this year's series of five conversations about architecture. Uh, I am not Dan Stern introducing Paul Goldberger. Um, I guess it was decided that after seven years I could finally introduce myself, which I am happy to be doing right now. Um, I'm also especially happy that our guest is Peter Rose, uh, the architect of one of this year's most widely honored buildings, the Canadian Centre for Architecture in Montreal, uh, which he will present in some detail and which we will discuss in more detail, as well as uh, some of his other work. Uh, Peter Rose was born in Montreal. Uh, he was educated both as an undergraduate and as an architect at Yale University, uh, from which he received his Bachelor of Architecture degree in 1970. Uh, he told me earlier that uh, had it not been for the fact that those years were post-Expo and in the middle of the Vietnam War, he might never have gone home. But the reality of Vietnam in 1970 being what it is, he went back to Canada and started out uh, not by working for another architect, as a lot of people uh, do beginning their careers, but as a builder. Uh, designing and building his own designs. Uh, in 1976, he opened his own architectural practice, Peter Rose Architect, which continues to this day in Montreal. Um, he is a teacher and it presently teaches at the Harvard School of Architecture. Uh, and for 15 years has organized and run and managed and conceptualized uh, the Alcan Architecture Lecture Series, uh, Canada's and by now one of the world's premier uh, series of architecture evenings. Uh, his work focuses particularly on the question of place, sense of place, uh, but I will leave that for him rather than uh, me to explain. Uh, before he joins us, uh, let me remind everyone that the last event in this series of five next week will be with Bernard Chumi, architect of the Parc de la Villette in Paris and dean of the Columbia School of Architecture. Uh, our format tonight, as always, will be uh, a short slide introduction uh, by Peter Rose. Uh, he and I will then repair to the lavish chairs on the side of the stage where we will recline and talk about the slides and anything else that they suggest. And then the final portion of the evening, as always, will be your questions. Uh, please feel free to write them on index cards at any point that they occur to you. And at some point uh, midway during our conversation, I'll ask the ushers to collect them and start sending them our way. With all that done, uh, once again, let me welcome all of you and ask you to join me in welcoming Peter Rose. Peter? Terrific. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, it's a great honor and a pleasure for me to be here in your company, Paul's company, and the company of my distinguished colleagues who've been before, and I guess one next week uh, will follow. Um, I, as Paul mentioned, run a lecture series uh, and have done so for 15 years in Montreal. It's a distinguished um, series, we like to think, um, and 
it's popular in that there are lots of people who go. Lots of people are here tonight. I'm very pleased to see you all. Um, I do it because I think it's very important to uh, have architects speak about their work and for uh, to, to generate as much exchange as possible, um, especially in Montreal, which is not like New York. It's slightly off the beaten path. It's actually very provincial. Um, but I say in private, and tonight we'll say in public, that for the most part, what architects say doesn't really count. Um, in fact, for the most part, I think it's best not to listen to what architects say. Um, just go and look at the buildings and make up your own minds. Um, <clears throat> but and the second thing is that it's very hard for architects to be brief, concise, to the point. And Paul is, in recognizing this problem, put a noose around our necks by giving us 10 minutes and 10 slides, which I have not actually met the requirement of 10 slides, but I promise to take only 10 minutes. Um, so bearing in mind that you shouldn't listen to what I say and that it's very difficult to be concise and brief, um, let me begin <coughs> with the slides. Whoops, okay. The other thing is that none of us can ever figure out the technology. Um, I suppose forward means on, no? Wrong again, oh yes, okay. Um, now I'm afraid I can't see my notes. It's all right. This will all work in a second. If I were Vincent Scully, I would throw my notes out there just to generate a little tension. <laughs> Um, I'm from Montreal, uh, a city that's somewhat north of here and very much colder. Um, this happens every single year. It's winter that strikes with a vengeance. Um, it's something that cannot but affect a person who lives there, especially a person who lives there a long period of time, indeed a lifetime. It changes the way you view the world, view yourself, and certainly view that place. It can be de debilitating. It can also be liberating. Um, for kids growing up in a, an environment of that sort, um, it's the time of great rejoicing because parents are really, and adults in general, are certainly a lot less powerful during the time of a storm. It's also a wonderful time when you have not a very good car to be at a stoplight beside someone in a Cadillac or a Mercedes because at that particular moment he is your equal. <laughs> or worse, if he's not as enthusiastic about driving in the snow. The landscape where I live um, is vast and rather raw and exists under a coating of white, <clears throat> the snow and the ice, for the better part of uh, six months, I think. It depends on how pessimistic one is. At noon on the 21st of December, the winter solstice, the sun is 21 degrees above the horizon. That's as high as it gets that day. If you live on the north side of the street or the south side of the street facing north, you never see the sun. Um, the upside is that sun hits the ground, which is white, and bounces up in your face. Um, sun is shining generally uh, at a very steep angle through the atmosphere, um, creates wonderful long dramatic shadows with very little relief on a building or on the bark of a tree, um, and is very colorful. Whoops, I just did something. I may have, you may have missed a slide. Um, a first, the first building that I, I, I was a builder, building my own work. The first building um, that was built by someone else was this building here. Um, I don't show many of the buildings that we built ourselves. Um, suffice it to say, I learned a lot um, and learned to respect the needs um, and skills of the builder and paid more for my education as a builder than I had for my education as an architect. Um, this is a ski building in a winter landscape in a little town um, I believe architecture is about problem solving, and the first problem is to correctly identify the problem that one is trying to solve. 
This was not a temple, not a church, not a railway station, but a place for the celebratory, somewhat carnivalesque act of skiing, watching people ski, being seen while you ski, um, and also for being in the cold at night when those lights are something which psychologically are warming, if physically not so. Um, um, it, it's a building with a sense of humor. It's lifted up. It's not actually that high, so you can see it from afar. And that sweeping, open-armed gesture that does, goes a long way for um, um, modulating the, the level of skills. Um, it's a big target to aim for if you're not too accurate. <laughs> An early house that is settled into that landscape, mindful of its position just back of the hill, allowing the wind to bump up and over. On the other side, which is the south side, the house is wind-free, opens up, and in fact, you can sit there in February when you cannot even stand out here uh, at the same time in the wind. Um, a site of a second house, which I, I'll just rip through these houses very briefly. Um, very site-specific, all of these buildings. This is in the part of, the, uh, of Quebec known as the Eastern Townships where the United Empire Loyalists went, the people who left America um, <clears throat> during the time of the Revolution to retain their loyalty to the, to the crown, to the monarch. And there's a tradition of English country houses in this large and beautiful landscape. And this house was built on the foundation, in fact, the ruin, uh, uh, the foundation of a house that had burned, an Edwardian house on that site. My city, a greystone neoclassical city, a city where two incompatible um, cultures have existed, coexisted in uh, conflict with each other for two centuries, um, as they've existed in Europe for uh, a lot longer, the French and the English. The English steadfastly refuse to acknowledge that they know French if they do. The French, for the most part, just insist that everyone else speak French. Um, it's a lively place, nevertheless, and it's a place where various strains of uh, gray stone buildings, neoclassical buildings in particular, Scottish baronial, um, Scottish English neoclassical, um, the chateau-esque and various French neoclassical buildings actually merge in a very interesting way. This is the building to which, or that I built on, attached the Canadian Centre for Architecture, the museum, uh, 150, 60,000 feet, uh, 40 odd million dollars, a lot of money, museum devoted to the subject of architecture. It, was on a site that had been devastated by uh, highway engineers, but in a quartier that is recognizably uh, of the character that I showed you previously. Four highway ramps are adjacent to this site, and this house, this idiosyncratic, symmetrical, but about a solid middle. Two entrances, two of everything you would really wish for only one to, to have only one of. This house sat forlornly in the middle of the site. Um, and our scheme enveloped, put, flanked it with two pieces in the position that two old uh, houses once sat. The whole ensemble is connected on the north by a big building, which is really the basic part um, of the museum. And you can see to the, off to the right, these high rises are not that much part of it when you're on the ground. Um, and to the right are the greystone uh, buildings surrounding. I believe architecture, especially in Montreal, uh, these are per anything I say that I believe in is just a personal thing. It's not something to, and it's not a prescription for anyone else, but in Montreal, which has a, a, I think, strong and interesting character and a long history, I think it's important to make new pieces that somehow set in, are set in, integrate, are integrated, rather than setting themselves off. Um, and. Uh, uh, rather than pieces that are, are more autonomous. Um, the old house and our new piece, um, in tectonic terms, the, the way that, that it's built and the materials, it's a modern use of the same stone, 
a modern use of a, of a metal that's the same color, but it's a new metal uh, installed and made a different way, but referring to the old the painted uh, iron or steel or tin, uh, always painted silver, that characterized our place. The building, I think, does not look very well it, as a whole. It, it's, it's never perceived that way on the ground. It's, it's rather episodic. But here, this is just to show you that it is one whole building. Um, that light I mentioned hits this fa facade, which is the north, every day of the year and rakes the facade um, in this manner. The shadows are much more horizontal in winter. This is more in the summer. That little line down the middle is the analogous to the, the middle of the old house, the Shaughnessy house I showed you. And then these shadows move, one sees them from the garden. It takes about an hour for them to rake, um, whoops, to rake up the building. Those little white streaks are three quarter inch setbacks. The metalwork is all off the shelf, off the rack stuff, bolted because it's anodized aluminum, which will not deteriorate for, in theory, hundreds of years. If you weld that material, it, it discolors. I happen to love the bolts. Um, the building is about construction and tells you how it's made um, when we need an opening that's too, that, that can't be spanned by limestone. We use concrete. The metalwork, as I mentioned, bolted together aluminum. That's the front door into the front stair. Um, the materials, uh, limestone, a silver metal, and wood, we're all, we, Phyllis and I joke that this building is about um, native species, uh, starting with her and me. Um, and the, the wood is maple, uh, but it's a veneer. The pieces are bolted on. That room was installed in about a week. The metal is aluminum. The stone, as I mentioned, is limestone. Um, more of the detail. You can see the bolts. There's a reference here to the stone these courtyards, the stair and the library, serve as views for the deep the, the rooms inside. Um, and the patterning, like stone, is to make reference to the exterior. That having been said, it's a meta. we show that it's wood by the bolts, by the fact that we show the grain and by how thin it is. It's not supporting anything, it's just bolted on. The galleries, um, very low light levels but with daylight, usually not attempted. Uh, Five-foot candles, the collections are all works on paper, which turn to cornflakes in any kind of light that's, that's bright. The conservators would prefer to keep collections like this in the vaults. Um, that's daylight bouncing gently up in the top. Little theater, again, using a very spare palette, basically three materials, um, again, bolted on pieces. The wood is always used for a practical reason. The light in the other room would turn paint to chalk in 10 years. Here the wood is used because it's good for sound. There's lots of tricks and games going on in this room, but we don't have time to talk about some pieces of furniture, a dictionary stand with adjustable shelving, aluminum and maple, a table that's 6 by 12, that can be used as a library table sitting down or to look at Beaux-Arts drawings that can be laid flat. You lift that beam up and adjust the lights. Again, aluminum, and in that case, plywood and linoleum, one of my favorite materials of all time. Um, it's a very, it's, it's an economical, straightforward building. A little court in which the, where the scholars can refer to the original materials, but with daylight around them. Um, daylight is never for the works, it's only for the human beings. The human spirit requires daylight, especially if you live in a place where it's so precious and so rare. And I close with two projects, um, a model and two model shots. This down at the base was a church in Montreal um, that had burned a transsexual organist felt that she or he was undervalued and never um, recognized for the musical or otherwise other type of genius that she or he was and burned the church down. <laughs> and our job, we always get impossible jobs um, in a developer competition, was to 
put a huge building on top of the ruins of the church to bring in money for the congregation, much diminished but much more needy in terms of funds. And in that facade, um, the, the actual chapel was on the front that would have, would have been a very abstract room. And we're attempting to, in that, you have to take my word for it, layering to contain the pieces, the real pieces uh, of the ruin that are there today, all that's left of the church, to build a new wall out of the same material, limestone, which would be our intervention, and to incise in our wall some of the traces, memory of the original church, the one that burned, and to disengage the church part from the office. It's, we think it was successful, but in any case. And then lastly, um, we seem to be getting these enormous jobs. Um, when I did the CCA, I, the biggest job previous to that had been a house. I don't, it's a question you might want to ask how to get the job. Um, and then this is an area of the city that had railway lands, railway yards in it. Railway yards have gone. It's also had highway ramps placed within it and underneath it. And there's a vast area adjacent to downtown that's simply empty. And this is a scheme which attempts to look at the traces of the history of this part of the city back to the eight, its beginnings in the 1820s and come up with urban form that is about and of Montreal, um, recognizably uh, um, in character, at the same time responding to the program, the problem posed by our client, which is the Canadian National Railways. Almost 10 minutes. That's it. Thank you very much. It's impossible to do that in 10 minutes. I know it's been done, but for me it's impossible. Thank you, Peter. Um, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, doesn't matter. Um, thank you. Uh, that uh, actually gave us a wonderful sense, not only of your work, but of the relationship to uh, to Montreal that you made so clear with that springtime shot of Montreal that you, you started with. Um, a light dusting, we call that. Light dusting, exactly, exactly. Uh, let's start by talking about the, the biggest job since it's what, at this point, your work is so well known for and what I have a feeling you were trying to say has brought in the other large jobs uh, that have come into your office since then. Uh, the CCA was, uh, as I think you, you may have alluded to but not really said, uh, was the philanthropy of Phyllis Lambert. Uh, probably, I guess, at this point, the greatest architectural philanthropist of this age. Uh, can you say a little bit about the background of the institution and how she came to you and uh, how you got the job and how it all worked before we go back to the building itself. Sure. How, how I got the job is a mystery to everybody, um, except that uh, I, was, I was the third architect to be engaged to do this job. And um, I didn't go out and celebrate and right. plan my whole career around it, having seen two architects prior to myself not finish it. Um, I knew Phyllis, uh, had known her for many years. She and I had returned to Montreal at almost the same time. She from Chicago and IIT and me from Yale. Um, and we'd shared a kind of passion for architecture, kind of volatile personalities that seemed to work together. Um, and. Uh, she had been sort of, she would ask me loaded questions about what I would do if and, or what I would do in certain circumstances and had been following my career. And in fact, I didn't show, we never built anything bigger than a house, but like many architects, we entered a lot of competitions 
and immediately prior to my being engaged to do the, uh, the CCA, I uh, participated in a competition for the National Gallery of Canada. Mine was the tiny office, the sort of throwaway entry. There were six other big firms in Canada. But a lot of people liked our firm and were surprised we could do it at all, and we produced a beautiful little book. And the director of the National Gallery of Canada said if she had a smaller museum, she would have given it to me, and I think she said that in the earshot of Phyllis. Um, Phyllis asked me in uh, six and a half years ago, or six years ago, seven years ago now, uh, in the fall of 19-something or other, if I, would I consider doing the job and I had a day to respond, and I responded by saying I'd be very happy to, but I couldn't start until January. I think she asked me in September, because I had a commitment to teach in Europe. And I thought that that, would be, that, that job would have been offered and withdrawn within the space right. of a day. Um, she, I said that the time to think about it would, do, would be beneficial, and she agreed with me, and that agreement uh, um, was something that informed our relationship throughout. It's, it's a building which cost a lot of money, but in fact is not very expensive as a museum. Uh, people said it must have been easy, she has a lot of money. It wasn't easy, and it wasn't because of the money that it was a wonderful thing to do. It was because she was dedicated to thinking things through, and if it took a little bit more time, the time was there took six years from the beginning to the end, and that element of time um, Well, she was, was also remarkable. really creating the institution as you were creating the building, right? I mean, the CCA was, uh, was founded to house her personal collections of photographs and drawings and things, but it was really developing and maturing as an institution as you were making a building for it. Yes. So the program was being written as the building was being designed and was evolving, right? Right, which, if, which was difficult. Um, and if one had been more confident of one's own skills and position, one would have said, you know, call us when you have the program. Right. Because they were um, wanting us to get it in the ground quickly, um, but not having the program at the same time. But I was... I mean, I think all architects are, have uh, insecurity sort of goes with the b business here. But I thought, boy, uh, their program is not very clear, but we better get that thing designed and in the ground as soon as we can, or right. maybe it will never happen. And I think actually Phyllis felt the same thing. She was anxious about this, and she wanted to get it in the ground. When we broke ground, which was four or four or five years ago, um, the CCA had a staff of 30 going to 45, and when we opened last spring, the staff was 120. Um, needless to say, we did a bit of redesign while we were under construction. That makes it the largest museum devoted solely to architecture yes. in the world, isn't it? Yes. Uh, well, I don't know. I don't. I. I. I, I don't know of any other comparable institution, but it's, right. it's pretty large. You, you asked, your, your comment about how it, uh, not how she hired me, but something about what was the sort of initial program or how, yeah. what were we trying to design. Um, I just, a couple of brief notes. Sure. Sure. The theme of fragility, in this case, pertaining to the collections was something that ran through everything. Fragility has since become something that we focused on a lot more. Our city, dis our city, not necessarily New York, but disappearing before our eyes, the environmental stuff, the global warming and all of that. Well, the museological equivalent of that is the drawing that tears in the middle of the night in a frame because the humidity drops from 60% to 15% due to weather change. That happened in the museum at, at home. And drawings which lose their color, films which our parents and or that we took in the 50s that just don't have any pigment in them anymore. This place was, um, was effectively set up as a place to conserve and, 
and to keep in perpetuity these valuable cultural artifacts. And that was Phyllis's and the conservators' goal. The money people who we had to deal with equally, Phyllis never, we wouldn't talk about those things, were on the opposite tack. And when we said how much it would cost and that the mechanical system was needed if we wanted to keep the works for, 50, for 100 years or 200 years, the response we would get was, well, let's shoot for 50 years. They didn't mind if the works turned to cornflakes, but this is an institution. And of course, all the while, she was going out buying more works, more drawings, more photographs, more artifacts of all kinds, right? So that the, as you were designing it, the collection, as I remember, expanded tremendously. Yes. And we, the, the building is designed to expand nowhere except in the vaults. And there's a, well, we had 60% empty vault planned and we're, we have only 40% empty, but we have a, an expansion program that can double the size. Well, the collection went from zero to being as large as the Royal Institute of British Architects, right? In sort of no time? Class. Something like that. Yeah. Okay. I, you know, and uh, the, the, the photographs, the photographic collection is the largest and best, people say. In the world. In the world, and the book, the library is, it's near the size of Avery. and. Um, one of the great treats was being able to look at, to look at the material. It's a, when I thought I was going to die, it kept me going. Um, and the presence, as I recall, of that old house was not an accident in that Phyllis Lambert bought the house, did she not, uh, before the museum actually existed and before she had any idea what to do with it to save it from demolition? Correct and then decided to build the museum around it. Right, she held it for almost a decade and mm -hmm. people, vandals uh, really destroyed a lot of it. Pigeons lived in it for a very long time. It was very mm -hmm. hard to get rid of four generations of pigeons that had, um, the cornice is pigeon proof, designed <laughs> with the help of pigeon experts. Um, and uh, it had been, it was actually a thorn in her side to some degree because it seemed really impossible to figure out a use for. And when she suggested, and I, or maybe I suggested to her, why not use it for the CCA because the CCA had been planned for another site in another building. Mm -hmm. We both thought, wow, that's a great idea. And then thought, oh no, that's impossible. How can you add on to that house? It's a, just a glorified semi-detached and you it's not a great house, actually. No, is it's, it? it's, it's uh, no. I mean, it's a good building, but it's not more than that. No, correct. Um, but we couldn't knock it down, given the climate. Neither of us believed in knocking things down, and both of us, in fact, believed that the difficult buildings, even the m mediocre buildings that are representative, legitimate representatives of an era and a, a, a period, a piece of our culture should be kept, should they, they have a valuable role to play. And uh, for all of the difficulties that that house caused us, um, I'm very pleased that we, we kept it. It's made our, it's weird, it's a strange building and what I said to some of my friends who gave me a hard time about how weird the new piece was, I said, well, you know, we had a choice to go with it and actually make something of the ensemble or try and pretend it wasn't there, sort of romantic, ro romanticize the place. But in fact, the highway ramps are there and that old house is there and I, I think we can't pretend things that are there aren't, so. Yeah, the whole composition strikes me as actually rather, rather tough and to use a word that actually we, we I may have done to death last week, unsentimental. Um, I mean, there are certain traditional elements. It is, it is in sympathy with classicism without being particularly classicist or historicist in and of itself. Um, is that how you see it? Yeah. I, th I think it's, a, I hope it's a modern building in that it's looking it with a relatively uh, cold, dispassionate view at the problem and as it, as, it's, as it presents itself and at the solutions technologically, tectonically um, that, that are available. 
And it's not, if it has a classical side, that's a device that is part of trying to build a bridge with the classical Cartier. But there's nothing romantic um, or sentimental about the classicism. In fact, it, my friends, uh, um, friends who normally, my friends are always critical, um, have, have often said, or in the early uh, going said how, um, how severe they thought the building was and how, you know, that this, how it was just, there was hardly any relief and no, hardly any, anything to really, it, it was just, too, too somber, too severe. My, my defense of it was that it exists over time in light and in a relationship with other buildings around it, but also with the people who ex experience it and, and touch it and see it under different conditions. And that buildings um, are, for the most part, about the long term. Unlike TV commercials, which have 30 seconds to tell you everything about themselves and then repeat themselves forever. Buildings, um, if they are a little aggressive in the early going, but somehow if you get to know them, reward you with, a, with continuous um, interest and, and, and life and change are all right. And I, I, think, I hope this building is subtle and rich enough that if you spend time with it, it will be a rewarding pal over time. Um, but it wasn't, and I was also mindful of the fact that it's an architecture museum and it would be around for hundreds of years and I didn't want it to go stale. Um, I, I'm, some of the things I loved five years ago, I really don't like much anymore. And so I'm, I, was very, I was actually consumed by the anxiety of using something that would be of the moment. So the well, it's a building, in fact, that, that to me very much transcends the, um, you know, the trendy side of postmodernism and lifts out the more profound aspects of the reuse of history without applying them particularly literally. Uh, you said a couple of things a minute ago. One of them, uh, the idea of, of becoming acquainted with the building over time, uh, I can buy. Uh, even though I think it may uh, not do justice to the experience of somebody who comes for an hour with all good intentions, but just life being what it is may never come again. Um, you certainly don't want to tell him that uh, he cannot experience the bu building fully. Uh, you said something else a moment ago that, that, that concerned me a little more, uh, which is when you said that that, well, it may be a little bit severe, but the people will uh, moderate that or medi mediate that, whatever, uh, which sounded to me distressingly like the old sort of Richard Meyer justification for painting everything white right. and having everything be very uh, austere. Uh, well, the people are the color, the people are the movement, the people are this, the people are that. Sounds um, awfully arrogant, doesn't it? it uh, I always thought I was a nice guy. Doesn't. <laughs> do <laughs> doesn't sound like that's really what you believe architecture is from some of the other things you've said. Um, that, can you pick Elaborate up on, on that, that a little bit? Yeah, I, I don't mean that at all. Um, I, but everything exists in, in a context, and the, my con, the context of those comments is the buildings that have been built in Montreal in recent times, and actually buildings in other places as well, particularly bu buildings for developers, buildings that need to be rented um, as fully as possible at a particular moment. Um, and buildings which, if they're not rented at that particular moment, risk uh, the financial um, uh, well-being of the, of the developer. Those buildings have to hit it when they open, they've got to be hot. They've got to be the latest stuff. Mm -hmm. And they end, up, they, they end up being a commercial product um, about style and about fashion and about the moment. 
And I think that architecture is done a certain amount of damage by that attitude, but it's an attitude that one is, is, has difficulty combating with the, the run-of-the-mill Canadian developer who will say, I want it to look like like this. Why, um, do you, I'm, why do you say Canadian? I mean, I'm not particularly well, aware that the run-of-the-mill American developer is significantly better, or any better. Well, whatever. I mean, I, I work with developers very happily and believe if we don't, um, I mean, I used to say I'll never work for a developer. I'm just going to do my stuff and uh, I'm not going to build only what I believe in. Well, I, I rapidly realized that um, developers are building, are remaking cities. They, if you want to have some impact on, on your city, to ignore the developer is to simply put your head in the sand. So one has to somehow make contact with these people. And there's some very enlightened and interesting developers. But I, f I felt that an, the enlightened view for a developer is to look at architecture as more of a long-term thing and do it well. And um, I mean, I noticed that condominiums at home have all their money in the lobby in the doorman's suit. And um, you know, uh, there's just so much marble and brass and bronze and junk th thrown around. And then when you get up, the, the, the worst moment is when you arrive at your house. <laughs> and I was, but I was thought that it should be the reverse. You know, it doesn't need to be all that money out on the street. And the unit, the best moment should be when you get in your living room, you sit down and you say, ah, they really did it right. Sure. So anyway, uh, it's a, uh, the CCA is more about the best moment of the building being when, it, when it's finished and when you go there and you spend some time, not necessarily 50 years with the building, but my friends, the friends who give me a hard time, these are my uh, banker friends I grew up with, have car phones, and they <laughs> drive by and say, you know, there are a couple of pigeons on the, um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> on the uh, theater but they never go in. And it looks, still looks kind of severe. I mean, the pigeons don't help. <laughs> and my response is, buy a ticket and go in and then tell me it's still severe. And usually if they do, it's not so bad. It's, so I, I don't, I'm an admirer of Richard Meyer, but I'm not saying that, uh, you know, I don't care what you think or how you feel, take 10 years and call me back. Right, okay. Um, let me ask you a couple of has to work sooner than that. more more specific things about the facade. Uh, facade is kind of severe, Peter. Actually, <laughs> it's, uh, why was the? But you only had an afternoon, Paul. <laughs> and it was kind of a gray one at that. I thought it was designed for gray afternoons. Wasn't it? Um, why is the entrance um, not more grandly scaled, given the? size of the building and the scope of the institution. Um, the entrance seems almost domestic in scale. Uh, and it's not particularly in scale with the <coughs> considerable width of that long facade. Right. Well, I have a line for that. Here you okay. oh. your notes. That's OK. Um, Thank you. Uh, I don't. First of all, I'm not. I'm not immune to criticism about the entrance. <laughs> there's some things I'm absolutely sure of, and there's some things that. Uh, I mean, I, I, having listened to a lot of lectures in my lecture series, I find there are two kinds of architects. Mm -hmm. There's a, a group that I admire who have uh, unwavering confidence that each work is a masterpiece and that they're geniuses. <laughs> and then there's another group that's a smaller group, but which I identify with, which sees every work as, as a process that, where there's some successes and some failures and lessons to take into the next one, which you hope will be better. Right. And it's a little tough to say that to Phyllis, who this is the only CCA she's going to build. <laughs> but she's she's How not. You know? But she's not without her criticism right. of the building, and and it and buildings have to take risks and have to 
risk right. failing certain things. But my explanation of the entrance, was, which I'm still happy though, there's, it was the last thing I figured mm -hmm. out, and that tells me that I, I'm, I never quite was comfortable with it. The old house is a weird bilateral symmetry, about a solid, about structure, with, as I said before, two of everything, uh, some of which you'd prefer to have only one of, particularly an entrance. It's very hard to have two doors. You always have a sign, please go to the other door. Um, in order to make my building work, it ended up being a bilateral symmetry. Mm -hmm. Not be, we tried to enter in the middle, but you kept on carrying into the old house, which was not the point. That was a tertiary point. You wanted to enter the building and have the stair and the galleries and get right. the house later on down the sequence. So it ended up being part of a bilateral symmetry, which is less powerful immediately than if it had been anywhere near the middle. That's the first thing. The second thing is that Prior to doing this building, I spent a lot of time in Florence, particularly, but in Italy and in Europe. And I noticed that some of the most heroic, monumental buildings that we all, well, in, in, in Florence, the Palazzi, for example, have doorways that, Pretty because small. of the, where they're set up and how they work in a choreography, episodically, you never miss them. I mean, nobody walks by, nobody gets, you know, goes too far and turns around and has to ask someone for directions. And as long as it works that way, I felt that, in fact, the building was more peaceful not having this super scaled thing that let you in or let you know where it was. And so, in fact, the building is a bit of an enigma from the south. You right. just know it's there. But if someone tells you or you explore, you find that from the north is where you enter. When you see the garden, that path, the little metal building on the street, mm -hmm. the axis that takes you in. If you pick up any of the clues, and I've never seen anyone miss them yet, you slowly but surely find your way in. And, I th and once you get there, the scale of the entrance is OK. Someone bought a watch once with no numbers on it and asked the guy who was selling it, how can I tell the time without the numbers? And a guy said, what time is it? It's a quarter after three. That's how you tell the time without the numbers. And my response, so I, I, it's, it's, it was part of an intuitive process. It kept chopping the building into the left part and the right part. And I wanted it to mm -hmm. it keep it. It's not very high and it's very long. So I'm sort of defensive about it. And I think it's mostly OK. And if I were to do the building again today, it would probably be different. <laughs> what about, <laughs> let me ask you, uh, before we turn to the inside, about the one other aspect of the exterior that um, I had some problems with, which is also a scale issue. I think the cornice itself is brilliant, the way in which uh, that fairly standard off-the-rack composition of metalwork uh, hooks on to stone and becomes, in effect, a, a modern equivalent of a classical cornice. Um, where it is not a modern equivalent of a classical cornice is in the sort of uh, limited, tight size of it. Uh, it seems to want to be bigger. It sort of, the building looks a little bit like it sort of had a crew cut at the top. Right. Um, the building? Oh, the, the cornice. Okay. The cornice, the building, whatever. Um, was thought given to making it just a little bigger, richer, longer, higher, what have you, uh, or, or not? Or was that just Well, a... the answer to that is sure, mm -hmm. um, or yes. OK. Uh, my father would prefer me to say yes. Um, my office, uh, I, the process of designing is one where I go to whatever lengths I can to simulate reality, whether it be by drawing or a model or what have you. Models are my favorite, and the bigger the better. Um, and we actually built full-scale mock-ups of all the critical pieces, mm -hmm. whole galleries, a whole bay of the building testing the stone, the pattern, and many full-scale mock-ups of the cornice. Um, 
and lots of smaller ones. Um, I have a, uh, my office is, about a third of it is, is full of these models that I don't, I can't throw away and uh, they're gonna take over soon. Um, my, my response to your question about the cornice is that testing it in all different conditions, trying it bigger, trying it smaller, trying the, the, the support members closer together, further apart, the blade, which is the piece on the top, attached to the building, pulled off the building as it is, solid, perforated. It ended up being as much a sculptural exercise mm -hmm. as anything else. And if you, in the light of my comments about light, um, it, its scale is as, as much involved with the scale of the shadows that it casts mm -hmm. day and night as it is as a piece yeah, I see your there. slide showed that. And um, I don't mind that, now you saw it, he saw it on a gray day. Um, what, wasn't much action on that part of it. I don't mind that, I, I mean, I Figured again. you were going to arrange for the weather to be whatever the yeah. building looked best in. Yeah, I got to come back. And, okay. I know. But I, I, so my answer is it may not be right. In fact, I tried to take it off many times because it's the one piece of the building. There are many ornamental pieces on the building. The, the wood panels are held on with little screws covered with aluminum caps which reflect at certain times. And there are quite a few more bolts holding the metalwork together than our, uh, my critical friends tell me are necessary. Um, but the cornice is the only piece that doesn't actually have a real function other than to make reference to a, a neoclassical vocabulary and to play in the sun. And I, that bothered me. Um, so I tried to take it off, but I ended up leaving it there because I felt it really made the building come alive. And I decided I could stand something decorative as long as it was a little lean and mean. I'm amazed you actually considered trying to do without it altogether. Oh, I've got I mean, how, how can you talk about it in such poetic terms as saying it makes the building come alive and in the same sentence say you thought of not having it? Um, because our architecture is this constant battle between um, the mind mm -hmm. and notions about what's right and theory right. and what you see and what you feel. And um, boy, I could show you zillions of beautiful things I had to throw away in the name of, I don't know. Um, it, it, you, want to, you want something to, to fit with your notion of what's correct about a building. I mean, I, I believe that that buildings should be, by and large, straightforward and built using an economy of means, uh, space, material, money, um, built to last, and all of those things. So, um, I, I mean, my real wish was to have the building be wonderful without the cornice, but it looked rather, it just, and, I, and I'm very interested in, in abstraction and the, Pairing away the reducing of things to the, the as I say, this e dealing right. with this economy of means, but I could never l like the building without the cornice. And my, in fact, I, I've, I've um, this raises an issue about theory and practice. I, I don't believe that theory is something you cook up and then the theory and design are sequential, that you develop a theory and then you build by it. Th theory, uh, a Viennese friend of mine talks about uh, theory as thinking for design. And what I ended up doing was going back and revising my, my particular theory about uh, ornament and decoration, which generally I'm not in favor of if it's kind of gratuitous, but if it's integrated, I can allow it. And I decided that the cornice was all, I, I had to figure out how to make the cornice all right intellectually because the building wasn't all right intuitively when I took it off. It doesn't make a lot of sense. No, no, it, it makes. That's why you shouldn't listen to architects. Just go look at the building and see. 
It was a, a two-year struggle, the cornice. But I, I'm thankful every day that I left it on. Okay, good. I mean, it, it does seem to me as though you, you, you feared beyond all reason the possibility that it could be frivolous. Right. Uh, which it, it so clearly isn't when you see it. Um, I, my greatest fear was that Paul Goldberger would write about the building and say that the cornice was the one non-essential piece. And, and so instead he went and wrote <laughs> that the cornice was too small and there should have been more of it, you see. Show, shows you not enough essential. Right, right. Not enough in essential. Exactly. Uh, the inside, uh, the entrance hall, of which I think you showed us one uh, slide, which is a really, to me, extraordinary room that is just brilliantly balanced between domestic and uh, civic scale, and and has the feeling of some of the great uh, country house halls of Lutchens or something where, where space does funny things and a great stair sort of controls the space and is shoved into the middle of it rather than the end of it. Um, but it also, to me, has a lot of the feeling of Khan. I don't think anybody has combined wood, metal, and stone as powerfully together in an interior space since Khan and the Kimball or the Yale building and so forth, as you've done there. Um, can, you, can you talk to us a little bit about that space and some of the other interiors? Well, maybe, maybe you don't want to say any more about uh, you know, the I, interior after that. Um, well, the interior, um, I don't, I never thought of the interior I mean, all architects would say that the interior and the exterior are both parts, just different parts of the building, and certainly sure. not in any way divorced. Um, but uh, the same, uh, I, I didn't talk much about materials, but I, I believe that architecture is about construction, materials, engineering, that the process of making buildings, designing buildings, is informed by a knowledge of construction, materials, engineering. That applies outside as well as inside. Mm -hmm. um, I think that I I'm amazed there's a building, a big, huge, very uh, important commercial building, recent building in Montreal that looks like the it's a materials showroom only turned inside out. There's so many materials on it that it looks like a, a confection, um, like a cake. Um, I was trying to find, to reduce the number of materials to a sm the smallest number possible that would do the job, however I chose to define the job. And then to use them, those materials, in a modern way, which included if we wanted wood because it was good in the sun, it was good for the sound, and it was durable for furniture, would last the, for the long term, it was durable in all three cases, that I didn't, I wanted to use the wood in the state that made sense now. Veneer on particle board. Um, particle board is more stable than plywood. Um, and we controlled the veneer by getting three trees sliced up, and we had a limited rain. We, the grain had variety, but not the extreme variety that you get in grain off the rack, um, and it's no more expensive. And then the edge uh, of plywood or particle board is kind of ugly, so that became a solid edge. And these pieces were made quite big and pinned with four screws, which meant you could prefab them and install them in a week. They're kept apart so that fluctuation in, in dimension because of changes of humidity when the sun shines in those rooms would never cause them to touch or to buckle. And it, it, it ended up being a lot about problem solving um, at a very basic level. The metal work, it's to make railings, you need, it's, the metal is the best. To make floors, stone is the best in the, in the entrance. And wood ended up being that material up above. Now, how I composed it after that, um, I can't actually 
tell you, except that I kept building more and more models and making more and more mock-ups. And I can tell you one thing. I'm a great believer that if, I can, if you can look at things and have time to look and see and experiencing, experience them and then think about them, you can actually make good architecture. Farmers, if you drive up through Vermont, have been making houses sited perfectly, oriented perfectly, landscaped, not perfectly, but beautifully, without the benefit of architects for centuries. And it's just because they've had the benefit of thinking about things. So those interiors are using our local wood, two materials from the outside, making them as spare as I could, making them function, and that's it. There's a wonderful sense throughout like the interiors, enough, actually, of, uh, of high-tech and craftsmanship being joined together, two things that I think we are conditioned to think of as being separate and, and almost uh, mutually exclusive. Uh, you know, things that deal in high tech tend to be uh, things that have no time or patience for traditional craftsmanship, cabinet work, and so forth. Yet they, they seem to be really equal partners inside this building. I, I think you can't make good buildings without craftsmanship. I mean, and craftsmanship doesn't... The, actually, the most wonderful craftsmanship that you see on the road these days exists in the very latest Japanese cars, the Mazda Miata. And it couldn't be more high-tech, production-oriented in terms of how it's made, but, the, but technology doesn't have to render things crude um, or crudely. And, I think that's, we, we had wonderful builders, and it, um, that aluminum is, is beautifully done, but it's, we just insisted that when we got the pieces, they were made to the best tolerances that they could make, and it didn't cost any more. There's an interesting, Norman Foster, who, who's a high-tech architect right. with a great, a highly refined sense of, sure how to put things together and an, and and there's a there's a craftsmanship about his work doesn't work with computers cuz he actually thinks he has to draw all that high tech stuff we drew all of our high tech stuff we went to the shops right. we went to the quarry we went to the metalworking places and we began to work hand in hand with the craftsmen and let them teach us how to do things and I, I think that's how good building is done. There's also a lot of very traditional craftsmanship in the building as well. I mean, w the wood furniture and such, uh, much of which you designed, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, before we move on to uh, other, other subjects, can you say a word about the way uh, the art is displayed, the way the galleries work, mm. uh, which have mainly architectural drawings in them, but some other things. Uh, if I'm... I'm very proud of, of this building, and I'm, I'm... It's one of those things that I'm, I'm amazed that I... I'm not amazed that I did it, but I, it was a long and difficult task. There were times when one thought one couldn't solve the problems as they were presented. But one of the things I'm most pleased with is that in the galleries, which have only works on paper, um, works which can, that have to be lit with five-foot candles, which there's nothing that dim here. The Cooper Hewitt works on paper exhibitions are five-foot candles when you go up the stairs into those rooms with all the windows blocked off. And commonly, works on paper are exhibited in ways that make you feel that the body's just in the next room. Um, I worked very hard to bring daylight into these galleries because I knew that we wouldn't have other galleries with daylight in them mm -hmm. to mediate against, to, uh, or to, 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 right. to, to, to um, offset what I felt was a kind of difficult problem of having no daylight. In fact, Everywhere that people are in the building, there's daylight. Um, 
So one of the things I'm most proud of is that there are five-foot candles on the wall, but that you can not only see daylight, but you can tell that it's daylight. It moves. It's a different color at different times of the day, different times of the year. And when clouds pass in front of the sun, it actually, you can sense that it's changing. And I believe that that, has, that allows you to stay in there longer, that a connection with nature, sitting at a window, looking at a tree, you can stand much longer than anything in a room without that contact to nature. Um, so that's one quality of the galleries. The other is that they are very high tech. They're loaded with technology all over the place. But I felt that in a room for art that that had to be a presence that was not, was felt possibly, but, but sublimated and, and it's, you have to look hard to find out where it is and um, how to gain access to it. Um, so that they're in the floor, there's a pattern of, of aluminum dots, which if you unscrew any of them, you gain access to structure. That glass wall sits on, a, on aluminum shoes so that we can brace it without nailing into the floor, which means we don't have to resand the floors every three months after every exhibition. Um, there's structure up in the top, which allows us to use thin cables to brace those glass walls. There, there's, well, anyway, I, it, I don't, it's hard without the slide to talk about it, but trying to control the smoke alarms, fire detectors, sprinklers, air, plugs, video, phone, power in little galleries, um, and yet not completely bury it was what I was trying to do and trying to bring daylight in that you could believe was daylight. Maybe you're aiming me in some other tack, but... No, no, no that, that's, that's fine. Has the building been attracting large crowds since it opened in May? Seems to have been. Good. 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 <clears throat> they actually sell enormous numbers of books in the bookshop, which is wonderful for us. And um, yeah, there, there, there's a great number of people with a burning desire to learn about architecture out there, and they seem to be filling the building Good. up on a regular Good. basis. Good. I want to ask you about some of the houses that you showed us at the beginning, as well as perhaps a couple that you, you didn't. Before I do that, let me ask the ushers if they can now, uh, might be a good moment to circulate and pick up your questions, which in a few minutes we will, we will turn to. Peter, I noticed in the houses, um, there seemed to be a, an evolution from uh, some stuff that very clearly showed that you studied at Yale when Charles Moore was the dean um, toward a more literal use of historicism, not in the sense of being directly imitative of anything, but uh, just a little more comfortable with uh, uh, being more, well, to use a a highly technical word, traditional. Or, or, you, or I would say building in the, within a, the, the within framework a, of a vernacular. Fine, okay. Can you talk about that evolution toward a vernacular architectural language, which is very clear in the houses? Because I think that probably informs a certain amount about the CCA as well and the other stuff you've done. I, I, I'd be pleased to. I, sh I should all, also mention that there's a generation of houses that has not yet seen the light of day, mm -hmm. which are um, working with vernacular, but are much more abstract and um, more, um, they're not like the CCA, um, but they're not like those earlier houses. I'm not sure how to describe them, but they're, they're reduced and more abstract and more about mm -hmm. materials and more about modern techniques of making things. Um, but to answer your question, uh -huh. um, it has to do with my having felt um, that the best buildings I saw uh, were not the ones in the magazines as much as the magazines made me very nervous um, in terms of what was hot and what wasn't. Um, but were the buildings that had been built carefully um, 
by the side of the road by people responding to local influences or traditions that might not if you trace their lineage back be entirely local but had been absorbed and had become local and again i was just trying to make houses that if you went by them would not jump out at you but would seem as if they were part of that landscape and part of that tradition um, and i i believed that strongly and i believe that now um, therefore um, let's see how to put this most least offensively um, i'm i'm troubled by seeing things that in Los Angeles that look the same as things on Long Island that look the same as things in Ohio because I think those are places that are fundamentally distinct one from the other and though the mod one of the realities of the modern world is that it's a very it's a shrinking place and we can do almost anything we want anywhere anytime um, that's a reality that I t I that I want to look at carefully and the other the flip side of the reality is the eroding local character regional character the differences the the um, the things that are extraordinary about particular places, particularity. Um, and I think Montreal is not fascinating because of what's similar to it, because of the similarities between it and places in France and who knows where else, but because of its, un its own uniqueness. And the more you study it and analyze it, the more intriguing it becomes. So my houses are just, are working within that spirit. Um, they, I, I, an architect I admire greatly um, for the, precisely the same reason and admire certain works more than others is Aldo Rossi, who was publicized greatly in the American architectural press and absorbed whole, undigested in architecture schools. You saw Rossi just popping up everywhere. When I went to, it, to Italy and went to look at Rossi buildings, I found I couldn't find them. I would drive by them and I'd have to ask, where, which is the Rossi building? And then I'd see an, a, sort of a photograph that I recognized. Um, and I, what I realized was that Rossi's buildings are all about the particular places in Italy that they were conceived for and that they just blend seamlessly in. The cemetery in Modena is just... You know, you can't tell where the old, and I mean, you can, but the people using it can't. And so anyway, it's, it's something I, I hope my houses don't, they're just there for people in the local area to experience as part of their place. And that's an awfully long-winded answer to a no, simple question. No, but it's, it's question. a question that gets to know. He's on the London time, I'm on your time, I should be able to be um, more succinct. We actually have a lot of questions, a lot of good ones. Um, let me uh, ask a couple of general ones first, and then maybe we'll come back to the CCA in a couple of minutes. Um, there are a couple of uh, Canada versus U.S. questions, and let me put them together. Uh, one just asks you if you can compare uh, current architectural attitudes in uh, uh, New York and... Uh, Montreal. Another asks, how do the schools of architecture in Montreal and Toronto compare to those in the United States? Do you want to see Tackle if those, those can possibly be tackled together? Sure. Um, Canada, it, it, in, at least Montreal, is a very slow place um, by comparison to New York. Um, not a lot happens. It's not very rich. It's a city in decline. Um, and there's a certain sadness to it, um, a wonderful history and a questionable future. Um, working there, then, you're not, you don't feel that you're on or dealing with the cutting edge. You, it's more mundane. 
Um, on the other hand, there's something kind of real about it in terms of its um, Well, my, my attitude that architecture has to do with the long term and that it's not necessary to get it to, to be absolutely um, about the moment. Um, it's more like building in Europe where people don't mind if you take your time and where um, people don't expect buildings to stand out. So that's a, a fundamental difference. Um, now, I'm viewed as in Canada as a very aggressive no longer so young, but as they say in my office, too old to die young architect. Um, and I'm aggressive because I keep fighting to do buildings a certain way that I believe in. And for the most part, people aren't fighting as hard to do things. And they think I'm more like what people must be in New York, must be like in New York. But um, it's definitely, you have some time I think it must be hard to work in New York because there's so many architects here, there's so much going on. The pressure of today and the latest thing that just popped before your eyes in a newspaper or on TV in this lecture or somebody else's lecture, I would think would be daunting and it would, it would, it would be difficult to keep one's attention focused on one's work. So Montreal is, is kind of a backwater by comparison. On the other hand, it's, it's a cultured city. It's, you can stay up all night um, with very interesting people in cafes. It's got a s small intellectual community that's stimulating and diverse. Um, and uh, to touch on the architecture schools, they're not very strong. And I don't Is that the reason you left to go to Yale? Uh, no, I left to go to Yale because my father was a professor at McGill. And <laughs> okay, enough, enough said. All right. um, uh, the, the architecture school. The architecture schools should be better than they are, but they're, we'll work on that. The CCA will help. Okay. Has the CCA at this point, or is, I guess it's really after a year of, not even a year of opening, uh, six, seven months of opening, it's too soon to really tell what effect the CCA will have on the level of architecture, of architectural culture in Canada, uh, I guess, isn't it? It, it is, but it, it won't hurt. It, mm -hmm. it cannot but help. Right. And the most important thing about it is that it, it brings people together on a daily basis. Um, in the presence of a building that most people acknowledge if they don't like it is a very serious building. Um, and among people who are very serious about architecture. And the point it makes, I think, is that architecture, we spend probably more on architecture than on anything else, and it lasts for a very long time. It's reflective of our culture. It's the stage within which our culture plays itself out. And it's folly to take it lightly. And the CCA is kind of hammering that home. Right. I think Good. it helps in that regard. Uh, I'm going to, once again, put together two questions that are not precisely the same, but somewhat similar in the thought that you can probably answer them together. Uh, the first is this. Renzo Piano experimented with many ways of, re of reflecting daylight when designing the galleries of the Menil Collection, which is in Houston. Uh, he used a lot of high-tech techniques to achieve the same aim as you did without high-tech. What difference in approach would you use in a more southerly climb? And second, I un but as I said, similar, I understand that you came to value sunlight so much. If you had grown up in New York, what would you value most and how would you incorporate it? <laughs> so if you can somehow put those two together. Uh, Houston and New York, in effect. Well, I, I admire Renzo Piano. I think he's a very good architect. Um, I think he does not give enough credit to his collaborator on every building that I admire, a man named Peter Rice, who's, I think, the greatest living engineer. Um, if I had Peter Rice to work with, and I'm going to try, my work might look a little more like Renzo Piano. Um, in North America, we use engineers as word processors, I think. They just, we give them the stuff when it's ready and have it
typed up. Um, and because the litigation situation here is so nasty, a threat of being sued, um, people don't experiment very much. And um, Renzo Piano, however, architects like Renzo Piano and Foster and others who I think work, who are pushing technology um, but not disregarding context or vernacular. Um, I think they do very interesting work. If I were in the South, I would use the same process as I used uh, in, um, in, in my building in the North. And um, a, a Piano's attitude to light was that it should be a sort of uniform filtering, uh, kind of through a, almost a mesh. And I'm not sure I believe in that system, but um, I don't know, I guess I'd go and spend a lot of time in Houston and think about the light and I'd go and, um, into as many art galleries in southern climes and I'd look at the art and I'd, I, I just have a very strange intuitive process and I never know where I'm going when I start out, but I believe in doing lots of research and lots of listening and trying to find as many people who know about the subject that I'm about to embark on. Um, the, the New York thing, um, New York has fantastic light um, and it's very precious here also when it hits those streets at the end of the day or um, bounces off buildings high up when you're low down in the dark. I think it's very moving and I've got many, many photographs I've taken of New York. Um, what would be the, pre the light is not the predominant thing that informed, informs my work in Canada, but it's, it's one, of me, one of a number of things about which I believe one should know as much as one can. It's free, it's there to be taken advantage of, and in fact without it there's no architecture because nothing exists without light, you can't see it. Um, I, New York, I don't know. I, New York is New York. New York is big and tall and tough and fast. Um, I have to think about New York. Okay. I um, only visit here. I've never built here. While you do, um, two more questions. I'm always putting these in pairs to try to get right. through as many as we can. There isn't a um, good short answer about New York. I mean, uh, that is my... Yeah. Uh, there's one question about uh, just the functioning of the CCA. Uh, who pays the staff? Where does all the money come from to run the center? Uh, I presume the answer is uh, it's really been endowed by Phyllis Lambert. Is that correct? Correct. Who is, for those who do not know, is uh, an heiress to the Seagram's fortune, which as long as people continue to drink will continue to uh, flow. Um, but but the intention is that it also seek public and private funds, right? Okay. Um, as any institution that starts out that way, but has a life yeah. into the future. Um, and another questioner asks specifically about Phyllis Lambert and points out that she is not just a philanthropist and not just a collector, but also a trained architect herself. And can you describe her role? as a co-architect in the CCA project, which I guess in a technical sense she was, right? She was your associate architect as well as the client? She was, um, yeah, she was, a, I refer to her as my collaborator. I met with her every week uh, for six years. Um, and uh, we had some very lively discussions and many ideas it's difficult to know the origin of. But I think that's true about all architecture, that any architect who tells you it's all from him is, um, I won't say he's a liar, but I just, there's a, fun, there's a, there's a great Italian architect named Libera, Adalberto Libera, who, modern architect, did a lot of, great work in the 30s, and he did a villa called the Villa Malaparte, which is on the coast near N Naples, and it's one of the most 
beautiful poetic buildings of of our time. It's, I urge you to look it up. It's in the current issue of Lotus, and it's, it's in it, most books. In any case, I just found out that the greatest part of that building was done by Mr. Malaparte and not Ms. the architect Libera. And the more you dig into the history of architecture, you find that buildings evolve in this kind of way that it, it's, it's not a straight line linear thing. So there's some very important things I mean, when I, would, when I was doing my tables, I brought in a table to fill us that I thought was okay, but I wasn't overwhelmed with. And, and Phyllis uncharacteristically, calmly sort of pondered for a minute and then said to me in the politest form of criticism that I got, um, tell me, what do you think uh, this table does uh, for the advancement of the art of table design? Well, what that did was actually produce a whole new... We then had a discussion about the art of table design, and it produced something which maybe modestly does advance the art of table design. But in, in any case, she's my collaborator, co-architect, whatever. Um, very, very involved, and um, I could not have asked for a better client. But obviously, a, a client who is herself a professional uh, and an opinionated professional at that cannot be the easiest kind of client to have. I mean, it, it, I, on one level, obviously, it is better than a client who knows nothing and understands nothing, but um, it, on another level, it must occasionally be confining. Well, it's confining on the level that you can't ever say, this is how I think it should be, and get her to go along like with I'm it the, she doesn't like sort agree. Of I'm, I'm, the ar I'm the architect, like I'm the daddy, and you right. listen to me. Um, right. I mean, you, you can't pull that, obviously. But it's surprising how little you get away with that one anyway. Um, <laughs> I, I, she was interested in... The, the agenda was architecture at the highest level that we were capable of, and generally when she had a criticism it was valid and it meant that I had to go back and research my position or consolidate my position and if I couldn't defend it successfully with her I couldn't get it I, I would not win that point but I think I can say honestly and so can she and so does she that there isn't something there, there's nothing in that building that we both aren't convinced is the best we could do so there aren't any, we didn't, there, there, there's, there wasn't ever a time when she said, I don't care, you're wrong, do it this way. And I know there was never a time when I said, I don't care, you're wrong, I'm going to do it my way. And are, you, are you convinced it is a better building than if she had simply said to you, uh, here's a check for $40 million, call me when it's finished? I'm convinced that every building that had a client, anyone who's going to use the building, and who knows about it, it's ge the genesis of the idea before the architect came on the, su on the scene can make it a better building than any architect can by himself, mm -hmm. my, in my opinion. Let me uh, turn to a more specific question about, in fact, a Canadian building, but not one of yours. As the embodiment of integration of site with the modern needs of an office building, uh, can we learn much from the Alcan building? This is uh, the Aluminum Company of Canada. If so, what impact has it had on your work and theory, and if not, why not? Boy, well, that's a very local question. It will mean nothing to most See of if you. if you can answer it concisely for people who don't know the Alcan building. Or briefly explain what might be notable about it. I don't know if I can do this without getting into trouble. My lecture series is sponsored by Alcan. <laughs> Um, my life, my, my patron of 15 years is a man named, for the lecture series, which is generously funded with no strings attached. I invite whomever I wish, um, as long as people go. Um, my patron is a man named David Culver, who's a very enlightened and noble figure, important for me. Um, when he came to build this building, I was too young and had too tiny an office. I've built other things for him. I mean, he might not have wanted to hire me either, but he hired another architect. Um, and the best thing um, that happened was that they saved 
five very good buildings on Sherbrooke Street, an important street analogous to Park Avenue. It's not a good analogy, but it's, it's an important street where the Ritz-Carlton Hotel is and some great old mansions, and a street that was, is, was really being badly damaged by rather careless development. So they saved those buildings, and for that they are to be much admired and gr greatly thanked. They then added some pieces in behind, architects that I, in, I, I in fact, had a role in this, but a much, uh, a very modest one, um, in a way that I don't think is terribly successful. Um, and um, if there's anyone who's going to go back to Montreal and repeat my comments, stand up now, and I'll stop right here. Okay, nobody's standing up. There's a saying, a wonderful French saying, which is that in the land of the blind, the man with one eye is king. And the Alcan building is an example for all of us, has been, because of how bad everything else was. Um, One-eyed architecture. And, but <laughs> it's not to be admired other than for having uh, uh, aimed, steered in a certain direction which direction we now, for the most part, all embrace, that of trying to integrate new projects and uh, w within the, the framework of old, um, new buildings and old, um, in some way that does damage to neither, but in fact um, makes both of, both of them better. Since the people of this city are voting on the subject tomorrow, could you say a few words about the pros and cons of using airspace above a church to build on? Oh, yeah. And I should actually mention parenthetically, there are a couple of other questions about tomorrow's uh, vote referendum on the city charter uh, and the uh, uh, significant changes in land use policy here that it would uh, uh, put into effect. Um, I don't think people are voting directly tomorrow in New York on the question of airspace, uh, although they, the charter does have some provisions that, uh, at least for me, are sufficient reason to vote no um, that would limit the power of the Landmarks Commission considerably. Uh, do you want to comment on that at all? Not on New York, but on the more generic mm -hmm. issue? Well, I mean, you've pointed out many times in, in what you've written, that there are no absolutes right. in architecture. There's, there's no big that's too big and small that's too small, and there's no air rights project that's okay. I mean, there's no way of saying that uh, certain types of air rights are okay and others are, are, are absolutely wrong. It's, it's sort of a situation by situation um, uh, thing that you have to examine. St. Bart's, all the s solutions I've seen, uh, it seemed that one lost St. Bart's in the making of the pieces that were to go at atop it. Now, I've not seen any recent stuff, and so maybe there's some better, some better things that have, have come. But by and large, um, most developers these days want to build things bigger than I think is good for us, and build things over uh, things that would be better left not built over. Right. I mean, there's a, the, is it the Olivetti building that Polshek built that piece yes. on top of? Yeah. I think that's really quite a wonderful thing, and an example yeah. of how you can take a little piece and use its air rights and not really right. miss um, what pre-existed. And one should never forget that what predated Rockefeller Center was a very modestly scaled Fifth Avenue. And it's hard to imagine Fifth Avenue being any better prior to Rockefeller Center, which at that time was a mega project beyond one's imaginings in terms of scale. I mean, back in the days when it wasn't owned by the Japanese, you remember, you're remembering that far back? Um, right. The, uh, the Fuji building? Right, right, exactly. Right. When am uh, I ever going to have a chance to go and stand on the 
outside gallery of the Fuji building. I, mm. I mean, I can't actually imagine they took those nice RCA yeah. down and put up the very banal GE. It's true. it's true. I never thought I'd have such affection for three letters. <laughs> we are near our, our end of our time, but let me give you one final question, um, which is where does the CCA stand in the sort of modern, postmodern debate or dialogue or dialectic? Whatever. Um, I hope outside it. Okay. Um, uh, though I, 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 now that we've, I, I think what postmodernism did for us all that was very positive was allow us to reconsider the value of tradition and context and history and include it in our daily life, architectural life. What it, I think, the error of it was its strident, it, it, it was sort of the same error that modernism commit, error, error is not the right word, but in its, its powerful rejection of modernism was in a way as wrong-headed in a sense or damaging as the rejection of tradition, history, and a sense context that modernism had espoused. So I think that postmodernism brought the rest of history into the playing field or onto the drawing board and now that that's happened uh, I think the, it, the, um, the job at hand is making modern buildings again or buildings that are about a particular time that make references to other times but we are the glue between the past and the future and buildings that we make today have that, um, that role. And so I, I, hope this, I hope that the CCA is, is post postmodern and sort of back into the kind of mainstream, um, uh, main, it's, mainstream is not the word, but trying to make architecture that speaks of it and about its time and also is trying to connect to the, to the various things that are around it and the things that have gone before it. Um, it's the relationships that postmodernism was um, pushing were too narrow and too prescriptive. Um, buildings can have relationships with highway ramps and, and with modern ugly buildings as well as the pretty ones and with postmodern ugly buildings as well as the pretty ones. So the, I hope the CCA is outside the postmodern discussion, but inside something that includes postmodern. Great. Good. Thank you all very much for being here. And Peter, thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. That was Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org.